Hello, this is Mark Truly, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow Marx and fellow editors, Mark Livecki and Mark Melton, reviewing several pieces from Providence this week. Uh, I will address my own article contrasting C.S. Lewis and Herbert Butterfield on how Christians should view uh, history. Mark Levecki is going to take some shots at it, I hear. Mark Melton will share his latest synthesis of Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, seen through uh, Niebuhr's journal uh, in the years after World War II. And Mark Levecki, among other topics, will discuss the new book on Christian realism, edited by our friends Eric Patterson and Robert Joustra. Uh, we hosted an event in our office this week, unveiling this new book, to which Mark Levecki contributed his own chapter. But first, briefly, let me touch on my C.S. my critique of this on the sacrosanct C.S. Lewis, long overdue for a critique, in that he wrote uh, an essay in the 1950s in which he warned against what he calls historicism, those who try to interpret into historical events uh, some larger meaning or purpose, obviously uh, in a secular classical sense, that would be Karl Marx or Hegel, but uh, somewhat surprisingly, he also takes on those who try to interpret history in a Christian way, and so we can discern God's judgments through unfolding events. And C.S. Lewis says we should not, in that we simply don't have enough information about the events of the past to make such conclusions, and we do not know we, where we ourselves stand within that narrative, whether towards the beginning, towards the end, or somewhere in the middle. So C.S. Lewis counsels that we should instead see God in our own personal day-to-day -day events. That is more than enough to uh, base our lives upon, and that we should, uh, by implication, leave trust the rest to Providence uh, with a very different perspective is C.S. Lewis's uh, contemporary, the Cambridge historian, Herbert Butterfield, who wrote a lot about Christianity and history and uh, is fairly enthusiastic about uh, discerning uh, God's will through history, although not dogmatically, I think he would agree with C.S. Lewis on that point, but he sees in the scriptures the basis for understanding that God is very much uh, uh, revealing himself through uh, the course of human events, and he says firmly that to deny God's presence in these events is to make him distant and to fall back on the sort of deist clockmaker approach to God, and uh, or even, not that he mentioned C.S. Lewis, but even to uh, abstain from any attempt at interpretation is to make God more distant. So I think in this case, Herbert Butterfield is correct and C.S. Lewis is wrong that uh, while we cannot be uh, dogmatic, certainly we should strive to try to understand God's purposes uh, in history, in the past, and in unfolding events up into our present times. So Mark Levecki, you disagree at least in part, so your thoughts? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend the fourth person of the Trinity a little bit here, um, being the good uh, almost evangelical that I uh, almost am. Uh, no, I, I mean, I think, I, I think the disagreement is only in part. I think, I think there's real disagreement between Lewis and Butterfield. Uh, I don't think the disagreement is that Lewis sees God as absent in history. Um, which I, th I think some of the critique came close to suggesting. Like Butterfield has this, he offers this seemingly binary option in how we view history. Either God, or either history is entirely chance, or that, as he puts it, um, one can trace everything back to God. And I think, I think Lewis would clearly, and I think you acknowledge this, Lewis would clearly reject the history is simply chance option. But I think he would be really careful with what we mean, uh, and he would be bewildered by what we mean by we can trace everything back to God. At one point in his article on historicism, he does acknowledge, he says, look, if, if God would take history and lay it all out before us, and if we could somehow not only see all of history laid out before us, but be able to keep within our minds all of history, so this you know, perfect access to all the information, 
and then God decided to comment on it, well, then we would see God in history. So we would agree with that. So I think your emphasis on Lewis thinking we don't have enough information to interpret history is, is the right point of focus. Uh, but I wouldn't want to overemphasize that by suggesting Lewis doesn't see God's hand. Um, as, you, as you quote yourself, he sees God's finger writing on history. He's just not sure we can read it. He is certainly scared of us making too much out of little things. And I think some examples would be, uh, I slipped on a banana peel and therefore missed my train. Um, is that chance? Is that God's hand? Well, if we, if we suggest it's God's hand, great, but what is being taught there? Like, what, what do I take away from that? Was I not supposed to go where I was trying to go? Am I supposed to rouse myself and really try harder to get there? Um, am I being punished? Is somebody else being punished because my not going there, you know, um, disadvantages them? So we, you know, we, we have information, we have instincts, but we don't know how to interpret that. You know, if, if Vinegar Joe still was, wasn't in China when he was in China and somebody more open and empathetic and maybe wise was, uh, maybe China wouldn't have gone communist. Well, Joe, you know, Vinegar Joe was there. So does that mean God wanted China to go communist? And I think those would be the kinds of things that Lewis would say, we just, all we can do is what we know is right moment by moment and and see god's will in that and and even there like you said there is overlap butterfield acknowledges there's either free will there's compromised free will where you know history has some sort of weird interpenetration with with human will um and we're not as free as we think we are so circumstances dictate what we do or there's something like divine intervention um but i think even with those caveats herbert butterfield would acknowledge and this is putting it somewhat artlessly that within history, God doesn't always get exactly what he wants, right? Um, and I don't mean that in any thick sense, uh, but we have it on good authority that God desires that everyone would be saved. We have it on equally good authority that not everyone will. So in some sense, God doesn't get everything he wants. So there is this weird interplay of, of human will and divine uh, determinism. And, and what that looks like, I think Lewis would be certainly more hesitant than Butterfield to expound on, um, but I think it's I think it's great bringing those those essays together, and uh, I, I love the essay because I think I think I think it's important. A practical question I have in an, as an ethicist is what difference does that make? And I would like to see both of them comment on that. Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan Sachs I think was wonderful on this. The late rabbi when he said he's often asked standing at the crematoria at Auschwitz, you know, where was God at Auschwitz? And Jonathan Sachs says, you know, where was God? You know, God was here. He, he was here in the commandment, thou shalt not murder. He was here in the commandment, love your neighbor. And so in one sense, however history is playing out, I know what I ought to do. And so I ought to do it. Um, but great article. I mean, I, I, think, I think, I hope it generates lots of comment because uh, I think that, that was a, a brilliant bringing together of two similar, but, but also very different perspectives. So. Thank you, Mark Levecki. I don't know how Reinhold Niebuhr would have come down between mm. the two. I expect more Butterfieldian than C.S. Lewis, but Mark Melton, mm. tell us about your essay uh, synthesizing post-World War II Reinhold Niebuhr. Right, so for the past two years, we've been going, or I've been going through Christianity and Crisis articles, as viewers of this show know, and have been picking out ones from set roughly 75 years from the date and publishing them, and with editorial notes. And in those notes, I do research to figure out what are they actually talking about, because sometimes, you know, issues they thought were very, very big deals to them that people would know 75 years later, we don't know what they are. So I go back and figure out what are they talking about, but also kind of expounding upon are there lessons here. And so out of all of those, I have kind of synthesized five overarching impressions lessons. And so these are not you know, five points that this is what Niebuhr and his people believed, because they actually kind of also disagreed with each other. And I kind of disagree with them at times. And so it's not an explanation of what they thought, because we have lots of people who have already done that. This is more of my impressions and kind of drawing out my own view of what Christ, what my own view of Christian realism is. And so the first point is talking about depravity and grace and the necessity of grace and that 
um, they looked at original sin as being very important. And I think their view might have been a little bit different from, you know, writer to writer of what we might say today, because they're part of a modernist theological movement. But the, you know, original sin was very important. And as others have written in our pages, that is a major difference between Christian realism and a lot of the other realists and other political theories that dominate today. And so one of the implications I find there is that, you know, from, you know, my own tradition, you know, original sin means depravity, like humans are not capable of doing good. They rely upon grace for anything good that happens in the world. And uh, I have a little section in there about how to interpret history, which maybe contrasts, actually, I would say it's, it hues much closer to what Lewis wrote than what Butterfield wrote. Um, but I also wrote it not thinking about or even reading those pieces there. So that's the first point, get that across. And then from that, that point of depravity, that view influences all the other ones going down. The second one I, um, you know, relook at H. Richard Niebuhr's article, which is uh, Reinhold Niebuhr's brother, talking about how you, you can't have a utilitarian Christianity. That's not really Christianity. It is that idea is you use Christianity for some other purpose, such as at that time it was good mental health. If you want good mental health, repent. Well, that's not how Christianity works. And so I look at that for a bit and I draw lessons upon because I think this applies to some of the discussions about, you know, I hear a couple of you know, a couple of different camps amongst Christians today. One camp would say we need a religious revival to save the country. And I would say, no, that's not how it works. We need grace to save the country. And so um, and then also the post-liberal camp, which is you know different, but yeah, I think both of those um, those views would get critiqued by the Richard Niebuhr article. Uh, the next part is accepting the world as it is, and this is something that we've talked about a lot. As you know, Christian realists need to have a robust understanding of the world, and I think because the writers of Christianity in Crisis spent a lot of time researching the issues, they went to the places. They went. Some of them went to China. Some of them, like Reinhold Niebuhr, went to Germany and went to Western Europe. And so I think as because of that, as events happen, they ch they choose the wiser foreign policy than what they were going for initially. Um, and one pragmatic bit, I don't know if y'all would disagree with this, but I would say for Christian realists, for every book of you know theology, political theology, or some type of philosophy book, they should read at least two books on history or other global affairs, because they, I think Christian realists really need to understand what's going on. And on that, I cite, uh, I believe Nigel Bigger wrote an article initially, his first article for us says, stop reading so much philosophy and read more history. And I think that is something Christian realists need to do. I don't think you're gonna, I'm, I, you know, it's great to quote St. Augustine, but you're not going to convince a lot of people that of based on that you're going to convince them if you know the subject really well and so i think christian realists need to really harp on that i also talk about a difference between the kind and a nice foreign policy i don't consider niceness a christian trait in fact i believe that night being nice can be unkind at times and so i think this is one point when i think Chris, the writers of christianity and crisis got you know, some of the issues wrong at the day. They were trying to be nice to the Soviet Union, thinking that they would stop being fearful and they would behave better. Well, that ended up, I think, being unkind in the long term. I think the kind position would have been a much firmer um, position in trying to force them to negotiate in good faith and letting them know if you cross a red line, there will be consequences. I think that is a kinder foreign policy. It's not nice. But frankly, being nice isn't biblical, whereas being kind is part of the fruit of the spirit. And the last point I make here is talking about the need for democratic stability. And what I mean by that is the government can't force policies that are egregiously against the self-interest of its citizens. And I think this is a they I think they would disagree with this. Self-interest was a dirty word for them. And so they promoted some policies that were not popular. And they ch chided Americans for not supporting, you know, for instance, the generous terms to the United Kingdom in 1946 when we gave them a loan. Uh, Americans didn't want to do it. So Congress didn't do it. They would have gotten voted out if they had done that. Um, and I think 
the Christian realists should understand that there will be limits to what the public will support, and they're going to have to live with that fact. And we need to take into consideration the self-interest of the citizens and voters. I believe this is a point that a lot of our Christianity or a lot of our Providence contributors agree on, and this is probably more of a right of center position too. For instance, like at our discussion a couple of days ago with uh, Joustra and Patterson, they affirmed you know, it is okay to look after the self-interest of your citizens as a government official, but that's not something that the Christianity in Crisis authors did. So that's a point that I would disagree with them on. So that's kind of a quick summary of all five. Go, you can read all of them. It's It, it ended up being a longer article than I anticipated, but yeah, there it is. And then finally, the new book on Christian realism, From Eric Patterson, Robert Jalstra, chapter by Mark Levecki. A few words from you, Mark Levecki. Uh, yeah, great book. It's beautifully done. Uh, we had, as Melton's alluded to, we had an opening uh, book launch uh, for it the other day. They did answer the question about interests posed by an eminent scholar of Christian realism. Uh, you can catch it on film. Uh, yeah, and they, and they equate interests with responsibility, right? We have special obligations to our own. The book I think is great. What, he, what they're attempting to do in here is to jump on what they identify as a resurgence of interest in Christian realism that arguably began, um, I don't know that they would agree with the, the pro providence of this, but arguably began in some ways under Obama with a, a renewed interest in Niebuhr when he proclaimed right on Niebuhr to be his favorite, um, uh, I believe the question was about his favorite theologian. Uh, but they identify three generations of Christian realism, and they divide this edited book into those three generations, the first being what they call the classical realists. And this takes us back to the English school and to, you know, so folks like Butterfield uh, and Reinhold Niebuhr on the American side. Um, then they move into the Cold War realists, uh, where Ramsey features quite prominently. And then they take us into the contemporary uh, age of Christian realism. Uh, which, which I should note, uh, is heavily influenced, it seems, uh, by the book's table of contents, by Providence and the work that we've been doing uh, over the last several years. Um, every single author, except one, and technically two, Gene Elstein, uh, have appeared in the pages of Providence, um, and all of them have featured largely in the pages of Providence. Uh, so I, I take that as a, uh, as a positive sign that we're up to something good. They acknowledge, of course, that Christian realism has its origins um, in scripture, so it goes beyond the English school, beyond Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, it's interpreted, you know, up through Augustine and Thomas Aquinas and Calvin and all those guys. Uh, but they they decided that it would be it would be salutary to have a collection of some of the the key texts uh, that have helped form Christian realism over the these three generations and up into the pre present day. So readers of Providence, I think, will be familiar with a lot of the content. I hope. Um, if we've been doing our job as well, but I, I commend the book to everybody. It's uh, it's quite impressive. Thank you, Mark Levecki, and thank you for this. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. We can't hear you. So I think, is this the point when we start taking over the show? I think this is it. We have finally zoomed in. Mark there you are. After right. it will become a Marxism of, sadly, really, two Marks unless Providence uh, intervenes. So, we we so, missed all of that. We missed all the closing remarks. You were on mute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went ahead and took over the show for a bit. <laughs> you you, you came back with a, with a tone of leniency that I don't want to miss. Well, there was an incoming phone call that was uh, overriding my brilliant uh, commentary that uh, oh. this is the, we'll have we'll squeeze one more Marxism out of Mark Melton before his departure as managing editor next week. Thereafter, Marxism dwindles down to a mere two marks unless uh, there is a providential intervention and a third mark uh, succeeds Mark Melton. So be in prayer for the successor for Mark Melton. Hopefully another mark. We have a number of marks that we know that we can periodically bring in as guests. Mark Amstutz, there's oh, and Thule is completely gone. He's back. Here. Oh, he's gone. And um, 
So, Mr. Melton, being your penultimate show, are you going to sign us off? Sure. Uh, all right, people. Thanks for listening and have a great weekend. No, no, no. Until Wait. next time. Oh, until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah, that's it. <laughs>